anybody miss seeing my t-shirt or not, but there you go. Today is Father's Day, so I'm going to try and share some, some scriptures with you about fathers. And I learned something today. It's not, a, it's not a scripture per se, but how many of you are familiar with a uh, Strong's Concordance? Okay, and you know in the back of the concordance, they've got the dictionaries for the Hebrew, Aramaic, Chaldee, and, and Greek. So when I was doing this, anybody want to guess what the first word in the Hebrew dictionary, uh, or in the, in, in the concordance is, in the dictionary? Ab. Okay, now, here's the thing. Ab is the Hebrew version. It's just two letters. And the Aramaic is Abba. Okay, so Ab is the first word in the Hebrew dictionary in the concordance. So it must be pretty important. So well, let's, let's start by praying and then we'll finish praying too, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the opportunity and privilege to gather in your presence in the name of Jesus with brothers and sisters. And we ask you, we invite you to come and be at the head of everything that we say and everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the word Abba, the one that we're most familiar with, um, is not really defined as daddy, That's right. which, you know, usually you think of a child using that word. But it's more appropriately translated Papa, Okay because it describes a filial relationship, um, whether you're an adult or a juvenile, Papa conveys that sense of relationship to Father. And in the Greek, uh, the word is pater, uh, P-A-T-E-R with that little accent over the E. <laughs> I can't remember what that's called. And uh, it begins to get into the definition um, of father and this is going to be appropriate for both languages so i'm not making a distinction there but it's nourisher protector upholder your nearest ancestor it can also be a more remote ancestor um the progenitor of, a, of the people a forefather you know it's that place where it all started and, and rolls down okay so i wanted to go over some duties of fathers and and this could also be um, duties of parents but but we're going to highlight fathers um, Deuteronomy 6 7 and these are all pretty familiar scriptures I threw some signs in here so it'd be easier to find <laughs> spend less time flipping okay Deuteronomy 6 7 Okay. All right. Let's. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna go back up a little bit farther. Now I'm gonna start at three. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thy heart. No, no, and verse 7. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou, ri when thou risest up. So one of the duties of a father is to teach his children from, from the beginning of life to the end, from the beginning of the day to the end of the day. And it's, it's not just everything that they need, but it's to focus, start with, you know, the Father, teaching them about God. You know, you lay that foundation that everything else gets built on. Okay? Now, Proverbs 22.6, um, a related scripture. Fathers are to train. Oops, let's see. All right. 22.6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. 
This is con then one of the things you're going to notice is all these scriptures have continuity. They're all on the same theme. They're all talking about the same thing. They're reinforcing the message. Okay? If, if God says something once, it's important. If he repeats it a second time, it's very important. If he continues to talk about it on and on, you know it is most important. And that's the way God is about this, about taking care of our children. We're going to teach them. We're going to train them. Um, another scripture, a little bit different part of it, uh, that we're to be providers. Uh, if you look in 2 Corinthians 12, 14. Okay, it says, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you. For I seek not yours, but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Okay? You know, when we're busy, as, as parents, sometimes we get a little carried away with working and saving and laying things up. And it's not always the case, but it can be the case that we lose focus and we start thinking about, well, what I'm going to do with this, what I'm going to get. But in truth, we should be laying this up for our children. You know, we want to provide for them as they're in our house. You know, make sure they've got enough food to eat, clothes to wear, a good roof over their head. But there are those times as they grow up and begin to move out that we need to have provided for, you know. There's a lot of things. I mean, those of us that are parents are, you know, we, cars, houses, education, you know, emergency money. Something goes wrong and we got to be there. I have a, a vivid memory um, many years ago. I'm trying to remember how many. Over 40 years ago, my late wife and I were at my parents' house for a holiday and we were preparing a meal. And Rose was helping my mom in the kitchen and she cut her finger severely. And we didn't have a whole lot of money back then. And so we got some pressure on the finger and was getting ready to go leave the house and go to the ER or whatever. And my dad went to his wallet and pulled out a couple hundred dollars and said, here, take this. That's the kind of provision and caring for that a father should show to his children. So, you know, I, I, I can relate to this very much. Uh, to nurture, that's another responsibility and duty. In Ephesians 6, 4. Let's see. Okay. I'm going to start with one and then we'll work down to four. Two sides here. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. Think about that. The first commandment with a promise was to honor your mother and father. That it may be well with thee, and thou mayest live long on the earth. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So, we're not to lord it over them. We're not to dominate and beat them down but we're to raise them up you know edifying is another good word that could be used in here we're to to nurture them raise them up and teach them what it is to be in right fellowship with god okay um let's see two more two more scriptures whoops first timothy one of the things that we're supposed to do and it's right to do. It may not sit well with children at the time, but we're supposed to control them. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> First Timothy 3, 4. I know the kids are thinking, what? <laughs> okay, uh, I'm going to start at verse 1. This is a true saying. If a man desireth the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality and apt to teach. Not given to wine, nor no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, money, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous. 
one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Okay? We're supposed to... Uh, this is... Okay. We're supposed to husband our children like they're a most precious crop to a farmer. We're supposed to do everything that it takes to bring them to harvest. Okay? And part of that is we control the environment. A farmer controls the environment as much as he can and circumstances for a crop. He tills the ground, he fertilizes, he waters, he watches over, drives out the pest or kills them, you know, whatever it takes. You know, but he's, he's taking control of that crop to bring it to the expected end. Okay? That's what we're to do as fathers. You know, it's, it's way too easy to lose your temper and get into your own ego and, you know, iron fist in a velvet glove and, you know, be too uh, heavy-handed and, and uh, controlling. That's not what's talked about. That's not what's talked about. Okay, and uh, last two scriptures in Proverbs. I think I lost my flags, but I think I can find these pretty well. Here we go. Whoops, it's snowing up here. <laughs> All right, Proverbs 13.24. I, I hope I'm inspiring you and waking you up, not putting you to sleep. Um, classic scripture. Um, he that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. And I think that probably translates many times. Okay? Now, this is something that God does to us because he loves us. He's not out to destroy us or tear us down, but he's trying to teach us, he's trying to guide us, he's trying to mature us. It's the same thing that we are to do with our children. And sometimes it takes a physical impartation to get the point home. Okay? It's just a fact. You know, I am not a proponent of abuse. I should never be done in anger. Um, but it needs to be done. Part of it is just so that they know you mean it. Okay? They got to take it serious. And last, uh, whoops, I must have missed the page here. Okay. I'm just going to tie another verse to it just because it sounds good. Uh, Proverbs 19, 17. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. Okay? When we discipline, physically discipline our children, it's no surprise, they're going to cry. They're not happy. It hurts. But you have to somewhat turn a deaf ear to that and understand what the purpose is, why you're doing this, and see it through to the end. Don't let them manipulate yeah. you and get you to stop it short. Okay? Now, all of these positive things I've said, I've also been guilty of the negative part. I didn't always do it right. I wasn't always collected. I wasn't always controlled. I don't know that I was ever too harsh or hard but you got to have the heart of the father in heaven to do it right okay and let him be your control let him be your guide all right let's pray heavenly father we thank you lord that you love us that you have adopted us as children that we have the right to call you my father those that know, don't know you don't have that right. So we thank you, Father, for the privilege. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness in disciplining us, in teaching us, in nurturing us. And Lord, I pray for every father, present and future, that's represented here. Lord, that you would open their hearts 
in their spirits and their minds to see and receive the lessons that you demonstrate to us of what it is to be a true father, a proper father. And we give you the thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to God. Amen. Woo. How many of you coming to church today, did you see the sun? Did you see the ring around the sun? If you did, raise your hand. Did you see the, it's like a, uh, it was like a rainbow type thing around the sun. I mean, I saw it with my sunglasses. You couldn't see it without it because I tried to look and I couldn't. But with my sunglasses, I saw the whole ring complete around the sun. There was not a cloud in that area at all. And I was sitting there thinking, I said, God, well, even while we were worshiping, I said, you know, this is Father's Day. And what did Father do? He brought a covenant, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so it was, I told David, I said, but this is a sign and a wonder. I don't think I've ever seen that before. I've seen an aurora around the moon, but I've never seen like a rainbow around the sun. It wasn't real bright, but you know, you could see, I could see the whole thing. It's like a covenant ring. And it's like God is saying, he is my covenant. He's my covenant. That's the best thing that the father could ever do was to give his son. And it was like, I was looking at that and I'm thinking, you know, that's the faithfulness of God and it's eternal. It never stops. It's just like the covenant ring. And I said, God, thank you. Thank you that your work is complete. You may, you, you may go ahead. Does anybody need an envelope? Anybody? You may take up the offering. Glory be to God. Well, happy Father's Day. Tom, Brother Tom, that was wonderful what you shared. Thank you. That was good. Very good. Cultivating our children. Training our children in the ways that they should go. Carving a path in the spirit of righteousness. Glory be to God. Don't ever take it lightly about your children. Happy Father's Day. I'm going to just read this. This is from Pastor Nye and your Faith Harvest family, of course. And um, this is Happy Father's Day. I put it out. I usually put it on the table, but y'all don't sometimes pick it up and read it. So I'm going to read it to you. Fathers and fathers-to-be. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord smile on you. Think about it. May the Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Wishing you a day rich with contentment as, as you enjoy being celebrated and praying it will be blessed with love and constant reminders of God's goodness in your life. Is God good or what? He is good in your life. You're still here, aren't you? Even through the troubles that many of us have gone through, many fathers, the load and the care to take care of a family, and the, the prayers that I love what Tom said, you know, about being in the presence of God and that relationship. You know, that's where, that's where the Father's heart is expressed is through your fatherhood. When you have that relationship with God, Jesus said, I'm the express image of my Father because I've been there. I worship, I love Him, I know Him, and He knows me. And, and when we're like that, then we become the express image of the Father to our own children. Amen. And mothers as well. Thank God for strong mothers. Amen. Amen. But we just praise God for every one of you. We release this blessing on you for his face to shine upon you, his favor to come. Even this year, this year, favor in the name of Jesus and strength and grace. Glory be to God and wisdom and counsel and to have a greater understanding of what God is doing in his plan and praying over your children, praying over your sons and your daughters. Glory be to God. Amen. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. So we appreciate every one of you. Thank you.
Lift your hands toward your giving. Father, we just thank you. We thank you for this seed, Lord God. We give you glory for it. It's a holy seed. It's, it's to you. We, we lift it up, Father, from the natural to the supernatural. We ask you to breathe upon it. Breathe upon every household, Lord God. This is your law, your order. This is how you uh, said increase would come, Lord God. It's that paradox. Something must die. Something must be planted in order for it to break out and live. So, Father, we speak life to this seed. We speak life into every household. We bind up the thief. We bind up those things that would come and hinder and try to take away the blessings we bind you up. We take authority over you. And Lord, we just loose whatever's necessary in every household. Yes. And that we'd be mindful and thankful for everything that we're increased with. Because it all comes from you, through you, and back to you. So we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this is Father's Day. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We do celebrate our fathers. I... I know of you, Tom. I don't know if there's anyone else. Um, and like I said, we've got a lot of our fathers out today. Um, is there anyone besides Tom that possibly lost their father this year or last year since last Father's Day? Anybody who lost a grandfather? Um, so we, we know of several that did that weren't here today. But, um, you know, we give you our... Our prayers and support in that praise God it's it's a tough thing when you lose a parent um, and I'll probably share a little bit more about this later but my dad passed away when I was five years old just just turned five about two weeks after that he passed and my mom never remarried so I grew up without a without a father and um, you know, my mom passed away in 2001. And, you know, all those years that I had my mom, you know, it was comforting to have a parent. But there's something that happens when you lose the second one. It changes a lot. The dynamics of your life changes because you realize there's been a major door in your life that's been closed. And, you know, so I, I do sympathize with those who have lost their parents. But we are thankful that we still have a Heavenly Father who loves us and cares for us and He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Amen. And I think that's one of the things that really helped me and I, I'll get to all that. I'm kind of running ahead of myself, but um, really helped me in my walk without having a dad was that when I got born again, um, I was introduced to God as my Father. And that's where I took my, my fatherhood. Praise God. And here there's a scripture in Ephesians. I'm going to get you to turn there with me if you would like. Ephesians chapter 3. When Paul was praying for the church. And of course he had several prayers here in the book of Ephesians. But he, he prays this prayer um, after he kind of gives the intent of the revelation of, the, of redemption that he had just described in chapter 3 beginning in verse 1 he goes all the way through this and he gives the intent uh, that God wanted to have a fellowship with man and this was an eternal purpose that he purposed in Christ and we can find this in several locations of the scriptures where it says that you know, we were chosen in Him before the foundation of the world. So this is an eternal purpose that God had already planned for us to have fellowship with Him through His Son, Jesus Christ. But he says here in chapter 3, verse 14, he says, Wherefore, I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole fam family in heaven and earth is named. Now I want to read this to you out of the Amplified, because this really brings a lot out of this uh, particular verse. It says, for this reason, and then in parentheses it says, grasping the greatness of this plan which, by which Jews and Gentiles are joined together in Christ, 
He says, I bow my knees in reverence before the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. God, the first and ultimate Father. And I loved what you shared this morning, Tom. It just brings back a lot of uh, memories of bringing up your children, you know, and things most of us that have our children grown, some of us are still, you know, have uh, uh, kids that are underage, but, you know, there's just something going back and looking at life and, and, and how you raised your kids. I didn't have an example so much to go by because I was without one. And so I had to take my example either from spiritual fathers that I looked up to and uh, mainly the Father, our Heavenly Father. And uh, so this is kind of what I want to share a little bit about today. Um, just learning what it is to, to be a father. And not just in the natural sense where, you know, we look at it as men fathering our children, but understanding the heart of the Father and how He wants us to live this life that He's chosen for us to live. And that applies to all of us. Amen. But now, <clears throat> back in 1988, and I look back in my notes to find out exactly when this was, so that was quite a few years ago, I preached a sermon on Father's Day called, What Makes a Father a Dad? And I think that there's an understanding that we all need to have in understanding relationship. And that's why, Tom, what, what you said was so good. Because anybody can father a child that's a, father, that's a man. I mean, it doesn't take a lot to bring forth a child into this world. But fathering a child does not necessarily mean you're going to father a child. And I mean that by the sense of what Paul said when he said, Abba, Father. He really, the, as Tom brought it out again, um, Abba being the word Father, and, and it emphasizing the endearment. Um, you remember Jesus many times would say, verily, verily. Or he would say, truly, truly. There was always an emphasis in the Hebrew when they gave two words back to back like that, that there was a greater emphasis. And, and when uh, it was repeated oftentimes, like, like, again, like you said, Tom, you could have preached my sermon this morning. Uh, it, it's that it, it adds validity and it adds importance to it. And so when... The scripture says, Abba, Father, it really could be translated, Father, Father. And um, it's giving you the intent that this is, he's a father, Father. He's, he's a real father. He's a, a genuine father. He's an important father. And, um, and I, I, I think about how that so many dads are not really dads. I mean, they're, they're fathers, but they're not dads. And so I gave back then in 1988 the acronym for the word father and went through these. So I'm just going to give these to you. This is really kind of separate from where we're going, but I just thought these were good for you to, to take a hold of today. The word father, F-A-T-H-E-R, F stands for faithful. A stands for active with the family. T stands for tough yet tender. H stands for humble and holy. E stands for example and an encourager. And R stands for res responsible and reliable. So if you can just kind of put all of those together, faithful, active with family, tough yet tender, humble but holy, an example, an encourager, a res responsible and reliable, uh, if you just incorporate those into your life, I'm telling you, you won't have any problem raising your kids right. So, you know, that's, you know, kind of a little extra there for you. But um, today we just entitled this Father's Day message because it's really about the Father. And uh, the idea that he writes here in Ephesians chapter 3, uh, the Amplified ending this passage that uh, from every family in heaven and earth is, derives its name, God the first and ultimate Father. I want that to just register on you. God, the first and ultimate Father. And I like the fact that you said Ab was the first. 
because that really emphasizes that he is to be first in our lives. Can you say amen? And then if you go over into chapter 5, this was chapter 3, but if you go over to chapter 5, it, in, it begins with this verse. King James says, Be therefore followers of God as dear children. Be followers of God as dear children. Uh, the Amplified, re, re, looking back at the Amplified, it says, Therefore be imitators of God. The word followers there is imitos, which means to imitate or to mimic. And it says, therefore, be imitators of God, in parentheses, copy him and follow his example. As well-beloved children imitate their fathers. Um, the contemporary English says, do as God does, after all, you are his children. The Message Bible says, watch what God does and then do it. Like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. So the idea here, of course, as Paul is describing, is that we are to be like God. We are to be a father in many ways. And I understand not only that in the sense of the natural, the word of father, our children, but in the spiritual sense of the word, as we grow in our relationship with God, our responsibility in the spirit is that we become mentors. And that we begin to learn how to father the younger ones. Yes. Uh, mothers are to mother y the younger women. Fathers are to father the younger men. And they're supposed to be spiritual fathers in our life. Paul talked about, he said, you can have thousands of teachers, but not many fathers. Because fathers invest in people. They invest their lives. You said the scripture earlier uh, that I have, you know, been spent and I will spend concerning his relationship with the church. And he said the children don't lay up for the fathers, the fathers do for the children. So there's a whole idea there that we need to grasp that every single one of us as men, and really this can apply to women as well, is, is that we are embarking on a journey to get to know God. We're in, embarking in a journey to become like God, but we're also looking back over those that are behind us that Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ, that as they follow us, that we begin to mentor them and father them in the faith, just like Paul did Timothy and, and Titus and others. So this is the intent, is God wants us to become like Him. He wants us to imitate Him. He wants us to learn about Him so that we can uh, become an example before others. Can you say amen? Yes. Now, the Scripture says in 2 Peter chapter 1, and all of us know this verse, but I'm just going to turn there and read it to you. But um, Peter said... According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you might be partakers of of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And I want to I want to mention this because I think this is really important. When Paul said there in Ephesians 5 it says be ye followers of God as dear children. The words be ye is the same Greek word you find here in in Peter where it says ye might be. Be ye ye might be are both the same Greek words Gineme. And it, it literally means, listen, it means to be made into something, to, to, to uh, become. It's not something you are, but it's something that you're seeking to become. You, you want to become a follower of God. You want to become a partaker of the divine nature. Now, we all know, based on redemption, that the moment we became born again, we became a new creature the nature of God came on the inside of us and we were changed. We became a new species of being. We had the, the life of God imparted into us. And so we have the divine nature in us. 
But, you know, having it in us and then becoming a partaker of it is kind of a little different because, you, you know, you can have something and never really benefit from it. You can have something and never be a partaker of it. And so when it comes to walking with God and becoming a partaker of this, it's going to take an effort on our part to follow after. It's going to take a, an effort on our part to begin to partake and to begin to uh, participate in what we have on the inside of us. And that's really the word here for partake is where we get the word koinia, which is to fellowship or to have communion. And so in our Christian experience, our journey is to get to know our Father to become like our Father, and what does all that mean to us? And that's really the essence of what I want to share with you this morning. If you go back again to the book of Ephesians, uh, you'll find something that is it's kind of a, a hidden truth here that's, that we, we kind of sometimes overlook. But three times, three times in this book, Paul mentions the fullness of God. In chapter 1, when he finishes his prayer, he says concerning Christ that he hath put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. And it says the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Then over in chapter 3, when he's making this prayer that we've just read, uh, for this cause I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. It says that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory to be strengthened with might by His Spirit in the inner man that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth, the length, the depth, and height. And notice this. And to know the love of Christ which passeth knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. There's that word again, fullness. And then if you go over into chapter 4, he talks about the ministry gifts being given in verse 11. It said, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God, unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. There's that word fullness again. So you're seeing something here of importance that's being repeated again. The word fullness the word in the Greek is pleroma, and we find over in Colossians, Paul brings this out again. Now, if those of you that aren't familiar with this, um, Paul wrote the book of Ephesians and Colossians at the same time. So they were both, they're almost like sister books sent out to two different churches. So you'll see a lot of comparison in the two books. And so when he's talking here in this prayer, he prays, um, and we won't take the time to read all of this. You can start in verse 9 and read all the way down through. But we're just going to pick it up in verse 15. He said, Who is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ, the firstborn of every creature? For by Him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by Him and for Him. And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist all things consist. They're held together. And He is the head of the body, the church, which is the beginning, or who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have the preeminence. Verse 19, For it pleased the Father that in Him should all fullness dwell. And then chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, For in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in Him, which is the head and principality uh, over all principalities and powers. So, so you, we've got something here we've got to really examine. We've got to really find out why Paul kept emphasizing this word fullness. Well, go back to John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1.
And of course, we all know this wonderful passage. The, in, the, in the beginning the word was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. That kind of correlates with what He just mentioned to us in Colossians. That all things by Him consist. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shined into darkness, the darkness comprehended it not. Then it goes down in verse 14, it says, And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And notice this, And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, And of His fullness, His fullness, have all we received, and grace for grace. So Paul is emphasizing again this word fullness that John wrote about, that John describes here, and it, and it tells us that this fullness we have received. And he says here, this, the way we receive it is grace for grace. In other words, you, know, you don't get it all at once, even though in Him is all that fullness, and we're in Him, so the action of that word implies that it's all available to us. But that doesn't mean we're walking in it. That's why he says be a follower. That's why he says that you might be a partaker. Is that we make a decision to go after this. This is our inheritance. When it talks about that we uh, give thanks unto the Father who hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance. The inheritance is this fullness. The inheritance is what we have in Christ that is in God. And so he goes on and describes Jesus. It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So that's, that's how we're going to gain this grace for grace is through Jesus Christ, His fullness. Verse 18, this very important verse, No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared him. Now this very interesting word, this word declare, because it's, it's describing actually a representative who is to reveal or to show you the Father. And isn't that what we find all the way through the gospel, uh, Jesus demonstrating to us the heart of the Father? Revealing Father to us. He'd say, you know, the works that I do, it's the Father in me. He said, I don't do anything that I don't see my Father do. I don't say anything that I don't see my Father, hear my Father say. In fact, one time in, in John 14, when Philip said, just show us the Father and it'll suffice us. And Jesus said, have I been so long with you, uh, Philip, and hast thou not known me? When you've seen me, yes. you've seen the Father. And then, of course, in John 10, I love this passage of Scripture. If you want to look at this, John chapter 10, uh, Jesus had just talked about uh, him being the shepherd. And uh, it says here in verse 22, and it was at Jerusalem, the Feast of the Dedication. This was what we would call Hanukkah, the Feast of Lights. And it was winter. And Jesus walked into the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe me not, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, listen to this, my Father which gave them to me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So Jesus is emphasizing this over and over again throughout His his, uh, his teachings about the Father. And then if you go over to John chapter 17, which is the, the Lord's Prayer, I mean, everybody says, you know, the, the model prayer that Jesus gave, and, 
Matthew chapter 6 is the Lord's Prayer, but actually it's the model prayer for us to, to follow. This is the Lord's Prayer, John 17, when He goes before the Lord, and we have that in writing here. But He goes through this passage, this whole passage that we have here, and He's talking to the Father, and He describes things that He does and it says here, you can look here at verse 6, he says, I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou gave me out of the world. And then if you go on down a little bit further, it says in verse 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. Then further on down, verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep through thy own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. Verse 12, where while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Verse, um, let's see, go over here to verse 21. It says that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them, as thou hast loved me. Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which thou hast given me. For thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. Now listen to these last two verses. O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee. Can you, can you hear the heart of Jesus in that? O righteous Father, the world hath not known Thee. But I have known Thee, and these have known that Thou hast sent me. And I have declared unto them Thy name, and I will declare it. Remember what He said there? That He came to declare Him. Yeah. And here it says, and he declared it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. So what you find here and all through this is Jesus came, we know, for the express purpose of dying on the cross, paying the price for our sin, and freeing us from the law of sin and death that held us in, in captivity. But, but above that, above the work that He came to do to set all of us free was to reveal to us the Father. He came to represent Him. He came to be to us what the Father is meant to be to us. He said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. And, you know, the interesting thing to me is we know that the blood of Jesus was pure from the time He came into this world to the time He left this world. And it was the blood that was shed for our redemption. We have redemption through His blood. But, you know, it's, it, it's, it's amazing to me that knowing that means that at any time in the 33 and a half years that Jesus lived on this earth, He could have died and His blood would have been sufficient to pay the price for man's sin. It wasn't a specific time that declared when redemption could be fulfilled. It was just simply His death that brought the, the fulfillment of it. But... There's a reason why Jesus didn't die as a baby and shed His blood the moment He came into this world or as a little child. There was a work that He did in revealing to us the heart of God. And for three and a half years, many signs and wonders were wrought through Jesus. The Bible tells us in Acts chapter 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus with the Holy Ghost and with power who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Listen, for God was with him. God used Jesus to demonstrate his love to the world. God so loved the world that he gave. And so the plan of God from the very beginning, if you go all the way back to Genesis, the intent of God's heart was to put life in man so that man could live the life of God. 
and to become an example for the world to be able to recognize God in man and to follow after God. When sin entered into the world and that, that um, representation of God was broken, there was no way of man knowing God. The Bible says in, in Romans chapter 3, uh, in fact, let me just read this to you so you can see how, how desperate man had become. It says, verse 10, Romans 3, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery in their way. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So in other words, it was basically they were depraved. They were without God. They were without hope and without God in the world. And so God had to send Jesus... Yes, to die for our, our sins, but to, to give us a model, to give us some indication of what the intent of God was for man. And so you go over to Hebrews 1, and you find out right there at the very beginning that Jesus was the express image of God. He was the, uh, the, the fullness of His glory, the express image of His person. And that word express image is actually one Greek word, and it literally means character. Yeah. Character, which it's defining something that is so similar in nature that it, it almost looks like a duplicate. Yeah. The, the express image of something means it's like a mold that's been cast, and, and the mold looks just like what it was molded into. It's like, you know, they would have um, a stamp that would, they would stamp documents in the old days. And, 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 and that stamp was a symbol that represented a royalty or whoever it was that was sending it. So, you know, we, we are kind of like, if you think about it, we have been stamped. We, uh, the, the, when the Bible talks about us being made in the image of God, being made in His likeness, there, there's a character marking in our person that is like God. We are spirit, God is spirit. And, and our spirit was designed to function in such a way that when the Father entered into us, He could live through us. He could show Himself through us and carry out the work that He needed done on the earth through us. Uh, Jesus had to come and reveal that to us. He is the example. We're to follow in His steps. We're to act like Him. We're to, to imitate Him. We're to be like Him in character and in thought and intent and purpose. And so this is the heart of God for the church. This is what you and I are meant to be. Can you say amen? Now, let me, let me, let me just share something with you because I think this is really uh, what I want to help get across today. When I was a, a baby Christian, and like I said, I, I grew up without a dad, so I didn't have a lot of example to follow after. And we weren't really strong church people. Uh, I started out strong. My dad was a Sunday school superintendent. Very uh, good man. Good, good for, and lived for God. And uh, uh, when, when he passed away, and we left where I lived to move to Florida. Uh, we, we just didn't get into a, the, a church where there was a lot of life. My mom was not a very strong Christian, even, she, even though she was a Christian. Uh, but just going to church was important enough for her, and that's it. And so we ended up in a very denominational church. And I, you know, didn't have a lot of training. In fact, when I was about 13 years old, you know, I lost interest in the church. And, you know, I, I, I really sympathize with some of our young people, um, 13, 14, 15, 16, up in that age, where there is just a, a real wilderness to life because you're not a child anymore, but yet you're not an adult. It's, it's what we call um, 
the lumina, l, uh, l, what is it, uh, luminosity, I think is how you pronounce it. But it's, it's talking about where you're kind of in limbo. You, 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 you want to let go of some things, you want to embrace some things, but you, you still have a love for this and you still don't want to be responsible. So, so there's that, that real hardship. And, um, and I remember those years. I remember not wanting to obey. I remember not wanting to follow mom. And I remember not wanting to go to church. And, and, and I did go a little wayward. And, uh, but, you know, when I was 18 years old, and you heard my testimony, I got hurt in an accident uh, doing a new gymnastic exercise. I was very athletic. And I injured my knee, and I injured it bad enough that I knew that it was going to need some kind of attention. The doctor had already drained it several times, but it kept swelling. So he was going to send me to a specialist. I went to church on that Sunday morning before I was to go to the doctor. And I remember when the minister called for people to come forward, my heart started pitter-pattering. And, and I felt the the conviction of the Holy Spirit. I, I didn't know what it was. I wasn't taught it. I didn't understand it. All I knew that there was something beginning to crumble on the inside. Uh, uh, it was a heart of surrender is what it was. And, um, uh, but I was hesitant. This first time I was in that church, so I didn't want to go forward. Um, and you all understand what I mean by that? You just kind of feel a little hesitant about wanting to be a, uh, that noticeable. And... Um, but when he said, if anybody needs prayer for healing, I want you to come down here. Well, I looked around and just to know how ignorant I was, I didn't see anybody else with crutches but me. And so I figured he must be directing it toward me. I must be the only one who needs to be healed. So I went down. And I remember as I stood there at the altar, and, I, and this is all still so fresh in my mind because I've, I've, I've rehearsed this in my heart many, many times. I know some of y'all have done the same thing. But I, I began to cry. I, and I began to cry big alligator tears. And I remember thinking inside, I have no reason to cry. Why am I crying? I'm not sad. I'm not disappointed. But I feel broken inside. And I knew it was, it was the Spirit of God was dealing with me. And, and in my own way, because nobody ever said, you know, you need to pray the sinner's prayer. You need to you know, confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior. I, I, nobody ever said anything like that to me. All I knew was inside of me, I felt like God was washing me and cleaning me. And things were changing. And it was all by Him. I, it wasn't my decision. It was all by him. He was doing it. But I was in a position to yield to that. I was in a position to accept what God was doing. I wasn't fighting him. And, and I remember after that when, when my sister came up to me and she said, um, why don't you just have him pray over you? Because he prayed a general prayer, but he never laid hands on me. And uh, I went up on the stage and asked him to pray for my leg. And he prayed. And when he prayed, the power of God went through me like lightning. I mean, I felt a bolt of lightning go through me like somebody had just shocked me and it took me to the floor. And when I got up, I was healed. I knew I was. I didn't even have to question it. I knew I could walk off that stage without my crutches. And the moment I put all my weight on my leg, I felt zero pain. I never had to go to the doctor the next day. I never had any work done on that knee. I was completely, totally healed. And, 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 and it changed my life. It literally changed my life. And so I was adamant about church then. I was adamant about going. And it wasn't about just being a Sunday Christian. It was about I wanted to know God. I wanted to follow God. I wanted to be everything God wanted me to be. And, and I remember I was only about a year old in the Lord when a dear sister, an older sister, um, kind of like a mother in the faith, introduced me to E.W. Kenyon. And I went to her house and she lent me some books to read. And just to give you an idea, you can't find these covers anymore. They've been re redone. These are old copies, probably in the 70s. But this book is one of the ones that changed my life. What happened from the cross to the throne. And this is another one that absolutely changed my life. 
is new creation realities. And so I'd, if you'll give me just a moment, I want to read a portion out of either one of them to show you how I came to understand the Father. Because it was through Him and His writings that I came to understand God as my Father. The very last chapter of this book, What Happened from the Cross to the Throne, which, by the way, this is a great book. It goes through all the steps that Jesus went through from the time He was made sin on the cross till He sat down at the right hand of God, which is redemption. But the very last chapter is called The Father's Care. It says, No truth is so far-reaching as this blessed fact that our Father cares for us. He is just Elohim, El Shaddai, and Jehovah to Israel. But He was shut up in the Holy of Holies. He dealt in awful judgment to the lawbreakers and disobedient. They did not know Him as a father. They did not know Him as a lover. They were commanded to love and obey Him or suffer the consequences. Then into this harsh, hard atmosphere of justice, Jesus came. They could not understand Him. He talked about their God as His Father. He told of the Father's love, the Father's care for His own. It mystified them. If he had come with a message like John the Baptist, commanding them to repent, calling them bitter names that they had to acknowledge were true, they would have understood. When he introduced a lover, a father God of love, his words fell upon unresponsive ears. Notice these scriptures and you will admit that we, as sons and daughters of this father God, have never seen this side of love. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if you shall ask anything of the Father, He will give it to you in my name. Verse, chapter 16, verse 27, For the Father Himself loveth you. Matthew 6, 8, Your heavenly Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask. Then also in the, the model prayer, After this manner, therefore pray, Our Father. Notice the utter tenderness of it. And then he goes on and, read, and mentions some other things, some things that just are uh, worth the wealth of, of knowledge. But he comes down to the very end of this, and this is just so endearing. And I, I still remember the first time I read this, it made me cry. But it says here, beginning in this verse, he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 19, it says, or know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Listen to this. God comes into our bodies. Think about what I'm talking about. The fullness of God. Jesus is the representative. He came to declare or to show us the Father. And then He put that fullness in us. And that we're to partake of it grace for grace. But notice this. It says, God comes into our bodies makes His home, lives in them so that He can speak through our voice, think through our minds, love through our hearts, make Himself absolutely one with us, swallowing up our very weakness with His strength. He absorbs our inefficiency with His sufficiency. Our privileges cannot be estimated. There is no passage that describes the Father's love attitude toward us more beautifully than Psalms 23. And we all know that. We all probably learn that as children. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Right? Listen to how he describes this. Not all of it, but some of it. He says, Jehovah is my shepherd, I shall not want. This is perfect satisfaction. This is finding the ultimate of living. I shall not want. It is beyond our understanding. It is in the realm of the Spirit. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. This is where the luscious clover and tender grasses carpet the ground. There is no effort required here to get enough. He not only cares, uh, causes me to go into green pastures, but He leads me beside the water of gentle stillness. Waters and food, water and food are the requisites that sustain life. He maketh me to lie down and rest in safety and quietness in the pastures of plenty. 
Near me is a babbling brook. Its living waters answers the cry of my heart. I have water. I have food. I have protection. I have shelter. I have care. This is my Father. When I am frightened and filled with fear, my whole being convulsed with agony, He restores my soul. He keeps me quiet. He makes me normal again. He brushes away my fears and anxieties, and He holds me to His breast and breathes into me His own courage and faith. My heart laughs at my enemies. For He guides me down the path of grace into the realm of righteousness, where I stand in His presence as though sin had never been. Where I romp and play in the throne room of grace with never a thought or fear or dread, my Father is the one who is on the throne. And I wrote this, I, I wrote this back in the 70s, but I wrote down here at the bottom, by a spirit of prophecy, throughout all eternity, I shall ever be by His side. Whew. With my guardian companions of mercy and goodness. And together with Him, shall I live in His presence, satisfied and fulfilled forever and forever. Whew. I wasn't expecting that. Sorry. But when I read that, it changed me. I realized that my father loved me dearly and cared enough for me that he would see through every need that I had that I would not want any good thing. Hallelujah. The Lord is our shepherd. And we shall not want. Amen. Amen. And then this particular chapter in this book is called God Reproducing Himself in Us. And I'm just going to take a couple quotes out of this. Every real father desires to reproduce himself in his son. The father's dream, the father's dream, say that with me. The father's dream is to reproduce himself in us. You understand that the new creation has received the nature and life of the Father. We invite the Holy Spirit who has imparted to us this nature from the Father to come into our body and make His home in us. Then as we begin to feed on the Word, practice the Word, live the Word, He builds that Word into us. The very genius of Christianity is the ability of God to build Himself into us through the Word, so that in our daily walk, we live like the Master. Isn't that good? Yes. Whew! Yes. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, concerning the, um, our relationship with God, he says, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 may throw some light on this. Things which I had not seen nor ear heard, which has not entered into the heart of man, whatever things God prepared for them that love Him. These are now revealed to us in this revelation through the Spirit. For the Holy Spirit is able to search all things, yea, the deep things of God. And our recreated spirit is enabled to follow the Holy Spirit in this searching of the riches of His grace. Most of these riches are in the Pauline Revelation. In Ephesians 3.8, we catch a glimpse of where Paul said, Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, was this grace given, to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. These unsearchable riches belong to us. This is our inheritance. This is the fullness of God. Like pearls, we have to search for them. For who among men knoweth the things of man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God none knoweth, save the spirit of God. In verse uh, 13 he says, But we receive not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Which things also we speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Spirit teacheth. We are learning 
to grasp this exact truth by the aid of the Holy Spirit. We find in Colossians 1, 9, and 10, this knowledge of His will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding is to enable us to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Every single one of us, our greatest desire as a Christian should be to be fruitful. Didn't Jesus say in John 15 that the Father said, this is what glorifies Him, that we bear much fruit. That we can't do anything on our own. He's the vine, we're the branches. And if we abide in Him, then we will bring forth fruit. Amen? He says this, we might say that it is a twofold walk. One phase of it is before the Father and the other is before the world. I am to walk worthy of the Lord before men so that they will recognize this new life in me. I am to be Jesusized. <laughs> if we could coin the word, that they will become Jesus conscious in my presence. Now, I love this, this example he gives here. This is so powerful. He said, two men were working in a shop. One of them was studying the Word in our classes. The fellow working on a lathe next to him said to him one morning, Harry, I would like to ask you something that is personal. What have you in your life that makes you so different from all the other men here in this room? The boy answered, Jesus. The man answered back and said, Oh, that's religion. I don't believe in that. The young boy said, It's not religion. It's the living Christ. First Philippians 1 says, For to me to live is Christ. Once those words burned in my heart for months. He's talking about himself. The master was saying to me, I want to be magnified in you. I want to absorb your personality. I want to take possession of your dreams and ambitions. I want to be first place in your life. But I was afraid of him. I spoke out, Lord, I don't dare let you have control of me. For if I do, I will never achieve the things for which I am so am ambitious. I, and I shall never forget a voice in my heart said, I love you more than you love yourself. I am more ambitious for your success than you are. I am the ability to put you over. Yes, that's good. I said, Lord, don't make me preach on the streets. You will send me down to the slums. I know it. I don't want to go there, Lord. And so I struggled again. But he was tender with me. His wisdom became so apparent. Often in my extremities, he had helped me. When I would get into difficulties, he would lift me. One day I said, Master, I will go with you. Here I am. Take all of my ability. Swallow up my ambition with your own. Give me love like your love. Help me to so live like that men can see you in me. They can feel you. And that when I speak, they will hear your voice. When I lay hands on the sick, it will be your hands. And then the scripture became clear. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live in faith, the faith which is in you, the Master, who loves me and gave himself up for me. Then I said, Now, Master, I trust you, and I give myself to you fully. These are the kind of things that broke me open. The truths that are here that brought a representation of who God wanted me to be and helped me to realize that my Christian faith was not of my works. It wasn't of my effort. It was simply my learning how to surrender. It was learning how to give in, allow the Spirit of God to have His way in my life, and that He had a better plan for my life than I did for my life. Yeah. And that if I would learn to follow Him, I could trust Him, that He had my best interests at heart. So this morning, I want you to stand, if you will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's something about the anointing.
we all understand there is an anointing. The Bible tells us that every single one of us have it in us, whether we realize it or not. Whether you've ever felt the unction of God, it's there. It's in you. It may be hidden, but it's in there. And some of us have operated in it and not even realized what it was. When we had a witness to do something, when we had a, a, a leading to do something, when we felt something uh, alive on the inside of us, we felt something quickened on the inside of us. That's the anointing at work. And it's there to help us live this life. And actually, if you want to give it a simple definition, the anointing is simply the ability of God to do what needs to be done that's beyond us. And so this morning, I'm going to ask you, if you would, just to bow your head, close your eyes. And I want you just to look down on the inside. And I want you just to acknowledge, number one, that you are in a position this morning to surrender everything. But you must ask yourself, have I? Have I really surrendered at all? I, I can promise you this. Listen to me very carefully. I can promise you this. All the ambition that you have, all the desires that you have, everything that you think you want in life, if you try to go after it without God being first and foremost in your life, you will become frustrated. That the only thing that's going to truly satisfy you and give you a future and a hope is when you surrender. And so I'm just going to ask you just to look down on the inside and, and just examine yourself, examine how fully committed you are, how fully surrendered you are. Just like Brother Kenyon wrote in his book, how he struggled with that surrender to give God full control and how God tenderly kept working. God doesn't force us. God doesn't make us. God doesn't twist our arm. He doesn't break our leg to make us obey Him. He doesn't rob us to, to make us follow Him. He, the Bible says the goodness of God is what leads us to repentance. And so allow Him to be a good God. Allow Him to be your Father. Allow Him to love on you, care for you, be faithful, be, be active in your life. Be tender, but tough. Be, be, be holy. Be humble before you to where He cares enough about you to pick you up. He's not a bragger. He's not a boaster. He doesn't try to uh, force Himself and, make cont and control you. That's not His nature. He wants to be an example. He wants to be an encourager. Hallelujah. He wants to be a responsible God, that He's always there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. And He wants you to be that to your generation, to your children, to those that you are discipling, that you be Him in the earth. That when people see you, they see the Father. So I'm going to ask you, if you'll just make that adjustment, if there needs to be an adjustment, just say, Lord, I'm, I'm coming home. Lord, I'm giving you all. I'm surrendering it all. I want, I want to be that light. I want to be that example. I want to be everything that you want me to be. I want to be a father to my children. I, I want to be a mother to my children. I want to be an example to my children. But I also want to be that to my neighbor. And I want to be that to my extended family. And I want to be that to the world. And so, Father, today, I make that consecration. Just as you did, Lord, in the garden. Not my will, but thine be done. Can you say amen?